Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the AGU Geodesy Early Career Webinar. Um, my name is Bill Hammond and I'm the uh, secretary of the AGU Geodesy section. Um, and I wanna welcome you to the first uh, webinar of the year. Um, uh, it's January, 2024, so happy new year. Um, and today the lecture is gonna be given by uh, Brendan Crowell, um, Brendan got his PhD uh, at Scripps, University of California, San Diego uh, in 2013. Uh, and he's now an assistant professor, research professor at the University of Washington. Um, and today he's gonna talk about GNSS velocities for seismic network applications. Um, and I wanna remind everyone that um, uh, we are recording the lecture uh, and it will be available on YouTube later. Um, and what we'll do is we'll we'll ask you to hold your questions until the end, um, and I'll turn off the ch the recording at that point. Um, but if you have a question that you'd like to uh, keep track of, um, you can drop it into the chat, uh, and we'll try to get to it at the end. So with that, Brendan, I think you are free to take it away. Um, share your right. screen. Yep. All right. Are you seeing the uh, proper view? Yep, it looks like your slides. All right. All right, cool. Let me actually make this a little smaller. All right. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about something that I've kind of started working on in the past four years or so um, on using GNSS velocities for different seismic network applications writ large. Um, you know, a lot of my past work has been in using high rate GNSS displacements for early warning, tsunami, earthquake, early warning. And so this is, you know, sort of continuing in that theme of going towards um, really, you know, collaborating with um, with seismic networks and trying to provide them with a product that uh, could take advantage of this data set. Um, and this is also based on, you know, recent funding from, from NASA. We have a project now with Earthscope, a three-year project to basically bring these um, seismic velocities, GNSS velocities to seismic networks, um, and then previously funded under the NEHERT program. All right. All right, so one of the main motivations here is that um, seismic and GNSS networks are quite independent. They were built for different reasons. Um, GNSS networks were often just built for tracking tectonic deformation, so more broadly um, distributed. Um, this is an example from the Chalice earthquake in 2020, so in, in you know, central Idaho. And this, this is the real-time GNSS network at the time. The, the green dots are the ones that were actually available. Many of these were recording at 5 hertz, some of them at 1 hertz. And then we compare it to the shake map for the event, which is just tracking how much shaking there is, and the available seismic stations that are circled here. These other dots are did you feel it reports from, from folks that just file a report with uh, on the website. Um, so you can see that the networks are quite different. Um, several of these seismic stations were also not operational at the time where they didn't provide any information to the shake map here. Um, so, you know, just looking at this alone, we should see that there's a, there's a big opportunity to sort of densify networks here. Um, and, you know, this is what those, those waveforms kind of look like. Um, I color coded them against the, the shake map. So, you know, the, these light greens, most of these motions are pretty small in this event, um, at least at the stations that we could record, but, you know, the quantit or qualitatively sort of match here. Um, so if we could get these observations into that original shake map, that would be you know, one way of, of improving these observations. Um, another motivation here is that broadband seismic instruments will actually clip in, in any large earthquake or even any moderate size earthquake. Um, so this example over here on the left is showing Basically, the first 13 seconds or so, a, a broadband seismometer for the El Mayor Cucapa earthquake, and then compared against a Kalman filtered, so this is taking GNSS plus accelerometer, 
come and filter it with the uh, you know the equations of motion, um, and then you can recover the entirety of the waveform. But when you look at just the part before the broadband seismometer clips, so velocity to velocity, these are more or less um, the same. They're they're you know they're basically recording the exact same information. Um, this example sort of shows that there's also these drifts in these time series. So you know, an inertial sensor is not going to be able to record all six components of motion, the, the three rotations and the three translations. So as you try to integrate an acceleration to velocity to displacement, you get these big drifts in the time series. And so in order to, you know, to use this information, if you want to use velocity or displacement waveforms, from just a, an accelerometer, you would have to do a high pass filter on this data. Um, often, a lot of seismic correction schemes are subjective. Um, this is an example from, um, this is the Tohoku earthquake here. And in a common procedure for, um, for correcting these, these seismic accelerations is to use what's called baseline corrections. This is popularized in the 80s and 90s, and where you basically force the integration with some sort of uh, co-seismic constraint. However, you know, when you provide that constraint to your time series will lead to vastly different results here. And then if you actually look at it in sort of, this is all the stations, the first 40 or 50 stations here. And um, this is just sort of showing the difference between the true motions and what you would obtain from either doing no constraint on the, the seismic accelerations or using that static field constraint. Um, you're basically not getting the right answer at any point. You're, you're not getting the right offset. You're not getting the right um, wiggles as they're happening. I'm, I'm not going to use the correct term here, but you know the wiggles aren't the same. There's phase offsets in the time series. Sometimes they're positive, sometimes negative. Um, they don't arrive at the same time. There's all sorts of issues with this. Um, this is just sort of further illustrating that exact same issue. Um, so this is four different earthquakes kind of going up in size from a 5.4 to 9.0. And um, the red observations are unfiltered and integrated accelerometer data. The blue are filtered and integrated accelerometer. And then the black, you could just assume is the GNSS displacements here. And so for the smaller events, um, the red, blue, and, and black more or less agree during the shaking. You know, this the unfiltered waveform kind of takes off here uh, at a certain point, but they're more or less the same. Same thing for uh, this magnitude 7.2, the El Cucapa, 60 kilometers from the source. Sure, there's differences, but they're more or less in agreement. Um, but then when you start to go up in size, you know, this unfiltered waveform really takes off at a certain point. You know, something obviously must have happened here for the Takachioki earthquake. But if you look at the filtered waveform, I mean, it, it is like vastly different here. This is tens of centimeter difference. Um, and then when you get up to the Tohoku earthquake, um, you know, the true final offset, something like two meters, it gets up to a two meter sort of peak uh, displacement. Um, but, you know, the, the filtered waveform is, is basically not showing much of anything. Obviously, if you zoom in, it'll look like something, but, um, you know, there's a lot of information in this low frequency component that is, you know, it's basically telling you a lot about the source that's happening. And then the unfiltered in this case is just uh, wildly uh, different from the, the GPS. All right, so just a quick recap of these motivations. You know, the broadband seismo seismic velocities will clip for uh, moderate ground motions in the near field. Um, so most big, big earthquakes won't have any broadband seismic recordings uh, in that near field range. Uh, accelerometers will track those ground motions. I mean, if you if you care about acceleration, it, it does fine for that. Um, however, since they are in an inertial frame, you're not going to really be able to disentangle the six independent components of motion. You know, in an inertial navigation system, you would include a gyro plus an accelerometer to kind of get at this, these three, these six components of motion um filtered and integrated accelerations will not be able to track any of those low frequency motions um for engineering seismology you often use spectral acceleration because that's not going to have this sort of issue but 
you know, is spectral acceleration actually the proper thing to be using? Should they be using spectral velocity or displacement here? Um, those low frequency motions are also very important for very tall buildings. Uh, you know, if you want to know the response of a tall building, it's going to be in the seconds and tens of seconds range, um, not in the, you know, tenth of a second range. Um, there's also, you know, parts of the source physics problem, you know, you're basically excluding this low frequency component a lot of the times, unless you include a GNSS um, constraint. You know, parts of the wave propagation, that, that sort of physics there, this is something I don't deal with at all, but, you know, there's an argument to be made that the wave propagation also would be impacted. And then this independent nature of those two networks, it, it's, you know, this is really um, one of the strongest arguments, but um, these other ones are also, are also very salient. All right, so I'm gonna show a few equations here, but I, I think, you know, seeing the, the GNSS observation equation and, and breaking the parts down here will really help to understand the benefits to what I'm gonna talk about further here. So, um, so, so for a, a basic phase observation that you're recording at a receiver, um, this is effectively the superposition of all these model terms. So the true range is just that the true distance from the satellite to receiver, that's actually what you want. Uh, you don't want any of these other terms really. Um, there's gonna be receiver and satellite clock errors uh, satellite clock's probably on the nanosecond range, so multiply that by speed of light, that's, you know, still in the, the tens of centimeters. Uh, receiver clocks are, are way worse than that, often in the microseconds or, you know, tenths of a microsecond range. Um, tropospheric delays, this is, you know, the dry atmosphere and the wet atmosphere delays. Um, those need to be taken into account. The ionospheric delay, this is a, a frequency dependent, this is a dispersive signal. Um, so it's different on L1 and L2. Uh, differential code biases. Um, these, this is basically the difference in the timing of when you're recording your L1 or your L2 on both the satellite and the receiver. So this needs to be taken into account. Phase ambiguities. There's an integer cycle, so you don't know exactly which phase peak you're on. But then there's also a fractional cycle part of that. And you'll hear the fractional cycle biases are or integer phase ambiguities. Those, that's the same term in here. It's just, we roll it all into one B. Phase windup is the slight rotation of the, the satellite in its orbit. This is usually taken into account with the orbits that you will get from say the IGS. Uh, and then multipath is signals bouncing off of other things and then other errors that we're not accounting for here. Um, so in, you know, Historically, a lot of people would use uh, dual frequency double differencing. So you're you're differencing between you know two receivers and two stations, and you can actually get rid of a lot of errors. You get rid of your your clock errors if you're close enough. You're getting your tropospheric error. You're going to get rid of the fractional cycle bias, um, and then if you form a combination of L1 and L2, you can get rid of the ionospheric delay here. So historically, the you know, the double difference was was the, the common approach here, but as orbits and other corrections have gotten better, uh, people do what's called precise point positioning, which is roughly just the triangulation between four satellites and a receiver. And you just are trying to beat down all these, these little noise sources here. Um, but one of the main problems in, in PPP is, is that ambiguity resolution problem. So you know, you want to be able to fix that integer ambiguity. And um, and this is often a, a process that can take many minutes to happen, um, you know, to basically get down to a stable state. And while this is occurring, um, the, the solutions, your displacement solutions are often unreliable. And so we really just want to be able to subvert the step completely uh, to allow for a much more reliable use of geodetic observations within seismic monitoring systems. All right, so if you take the time difference between two phase observations, so say this is a second two and you want to subtract the same equation at second one, um, you basically end up getting the change in range. So this is the velocity of your satellite plus any motions at the station. Um, you'll have a receiver clock drift rate because the receiver clocks are generally uh, pretty bad. 
And then all these other terms more or less drop out. Um, the satellite clock drift rate is, is very negligible. Um, tropospheric delays, they could be an issue, but more or less, they're not going to change over a second or two seconds. Ionosphere, we can take care of other ways. That also doesn't change on a second or two second sort of uh, level, usually. Um, DCBs more or less don't change. If you have no cycle slips, your phase ambiguity is irrelevant, and then you're able to get rid of phase windup and multipath as well. Um, and within this approach, um, we don't actually need precise orbits. We can use the broadcast orbits because we don't actually care that the satellite is, you know, we have the accuracy at one centimeter or, you know, one millimeter. We just want to know, you know, where it's going. And it's traveling pretty fast along this orbit. So, you know, being off in true position by, say, a, a half a meter or something doesn't really matter because you just care, like, it goes from point A to point B, and that velocity is actually quite large. Um, and then we also, we do not need to account for those phase ambiguities at all. Um, so this is something that could be done on the site because you can use broadcast orbits. Um, and then we'll, we'll often make different linear combinations of, of phase observables um, to either get velocity or total electron content, or, you know, we don't even have to make a linear combination. You could use just an L1 or L2 solution. So if you do want to get the velocities in just a single frequency here, uh, this is a sort of system of equations we have. You have four unknowns to so the velocity at x, x y, z. Uh, this is you know an ITRF um, velocities. And then the receiver clock drift rate. These are the four terms you want to solve for. We have the change in the phase um, L1 for the four different satellites recorded at a receiver, the change in range for those four different satellites. And then we have the um, the direction cosines here. So this is just the, the direction from your receiver to your satellite. Um, and then receiver collector phrase, just a bunch of ones here. Um, so in GNSS positioning, it is common to form these linear combinations of phase observables. So L1, L2, or L5, or some of the multi-GNSS would be other, you know, L6 and 8 and whatever. Um, but so some of the you know past ones that have been used, so Vodase is one software package. They use the ionosphere free combination, which gets rid of those first order ionosphere changes. Um, in the code that I wrote called Snivel, we actually use the narrow lane combination, which is right here. These are just the frequencies of the L1 and L2 um, for the GPS system. This has a, a effective wavelength that's actually less than L1 or L2. This reduces noise maybe by like one to two percent. So it's not like a, a huge difference here, but it, it's it's a little bit of a difference. Um, I, I want to highlight that none of this is new. Um, so for geophysical applications, usually Colissimo et al. 2011 is, is credited as the first demonstration. I really should say for geophysical seismic applications, um, you know, this was done for other like broad tectonic geodesy purposes uh, before that. Um, but, you know, I just did a, a really brief uh, literature review to try and find some much, much older uh, papers on this, and I found this one from 1986 on the triple difference solution. Um, the triple difference is basically a double difference with a time difference. So, you know, in, in this, this is the text from this paper. Um, you know, based the differencing of double differences corresponding to two different epochs. That so that's the triple difference here. Uh, proposed in you know in the early 1980s. Remind you that. The GPS time starts at January 6, 1980. So this is very early on. Um, and it was often used for like orbital determination uh, purposes at that time. So definitely not new. Um, it's also not unique. Um, so, you know, there's four different code packages that, you know, I've, I've recently come to, to see, but I'm, I'm certain there's other ones out there. Um, so there's the Vadasse um, from the Italian group. Um, this one just came out. This is a MATLAB package that's the, doing multi-GNSS. Um, 
on multiple different frequencies. Um, the Instavels is actually a little bit different because it's using Doppler rather than the, just a simple change in orbit, but it's um, it's basically the same sort of flavor of solutions. And then this is where I um, wrote about my code snivel here. All right, and this goes way beyond seismology. Um, so, you know, in snivel, we're normally performing the narrow lane for velocity. However, if you just perform the geometry free combination, you can get the ionospheric contribution and this is, this is an example from the Tonga eruption where both the atmospheric pressure wave and the tsunami generated acoustic gravity waves propagate basically all around the globe. But this is just the within 5,000 kilometers in this figure. Um, and yeah, you can just track the different phases based on, you know, is it tsunami or is this, uh, you know, the uh, supersonic pulse or, or some other, the lamb wave. Um, you know, the, those all propagate at slightly different speeds here. Um, and I've, I've also recently come into some other examples that look at variometric um, atmospheric delays from weather systems. So, you know, it's it's really a, a convenient approach. All right, so I'll just jump into some examples here. So I'm going to first start off with some waveforms from recent earthquakes. Um, you know, really just get down to the simple part of it. Um, I'm going to spend a good chunk of time on validating uh, this global data set of five plus hertz GNSS velocities against uh, seismic ground motion models. So this, these are usually the, the crux of, say, an early warning system or shake maps um, for post-event response. Um, going to look at how we can modify shake maps with this, these observations. The development of new scaling laws for earthquake early warning. Uh, some machine learning applications for in, in two different veins of obtaining displacements and also reconciling noise from source. And then talk a bit about our project to provide real-time velocity and, and total electron content streams. All right, so this is um, an example of a co-located seismic and GNSS station for the Chignik earthquake. Um, so I downsampled the seismic waveform which is the red and the the blue is the um is the GNSS station and you know if we look at it wiggle for wiggle these are basically the same the only difference between these waveforms is effectively the, the pre-event noise so you can see that the GNSS velocity stream has a slightly higher noise i mean it's basically nothing in this in this um the strong motion here but um, that's basically it. You know, you can, you know, go around, track the different ups and downs, and they, they're all correlating here. And we've done some proper correlations with other earthquakes and show this to be well above 0.7 for, for many co-located stations. Um, on the large ground motion end, you know, it doesn't appear that there is an upper limit to how much you can record. Um, this is an example from the Kayakura earthquake, just showing the displacement stream. And these are recorded at 10 hertz in this case, and then the velocity stream in the background. So you can see where there's these sort of big blips of motion that kind of correspond to the displacements, maybe a little phase lagged here. Um, the, in the Amatrice or the Norcia earthquake sequence in Italy in 2014, um, these were 20 hertz observations getting upwards of a of a meter per second in this case. Um, and then for the Nepal earthquake, the station um, NAST, you know, it, this waveform is recording both the, the main shock and an aftershock. And I just zoom in on the main shock and the aftershock. So, you, you know, you can see that it has a, a decent dynamic range. It's recording something smaller, recording something big. These have really big oscillation. They're, you know, it's obviously, um, there's some sort of resonance here at the station, um, but you know that's that's a a feature of this earthquake um, in those basins. Um, I like to show this example because it's completely absurd. Um, so this is a station that's built in the middle of Lake Topo in New Zealand, and this was maybe two years or a year ago, maybe two years ago. Um, this is the shake map, so the location of the the earthquake. And then this is my best guess as the location of it. I just had to overlay the maps here. Um, but you know, the, 
this station is built on these wooden wooden pilings that are just driven down into the mud in this lake. So this is not a real ground motion. You know, a lot of this is site response of this station. But if you look at this north component, it hits 3.3 meters per second. And this would make it, you know, the largest ground motion observation of any earthquake. Obviously, it's not truly real. Um, but this is what the antenna was doing up there. If you were on this platform, you would have been launched into the lake. Like, there's no way you could actually withstand this level of shaking. One meter per second is incredibly violent. Um, there's usually, you don't see too many records above one meter per second. So to have hit 3.3 is very remarkable. Um, this is an example from the same station recording two events uh, separated by uh, nine years. Um, so the shake maps for the most recent one. And then there's this 2014, a 7.3 earthquake in El Salvador. Um, and this this is for the 6.5. Um, so, you know, just looking at the waveforms, you can actually tell that these are quite different types of sources. You know, they have very different focal mechanisms. Um, the location is obviously further for the 7.3 because the arrivals are a little later. Um, the the 6.5 is, is actually much more impulsive. So maybe there's a little more directivity towards the station here. Um, you can tell that, you know, probably the direction or the location of the source is different because the east component's bigger on the 7.3 than the north component. Whereas for the, the 6.5, they're about the same. And, and that's really because the love wave is the predominant wave you're seeing here. So, you know, if the east component's a little bigger, the waves are probably going to be coming a little more from the south for this event so, to generate that east-west motion here. So just from, you know, looking at two waveforms, you know, we can we can say a, a decent amount about the differences between these earthquakes, which I, I always encourage geodesists to look at these types of, of signals to sort of get your, your mind in tuned with, um, you know, the complexities of seismic wave propagation. All right, so I'm going to talk a, a little bit about this global data set of, um, of earthquakes that we've compiled. And this is an, a, a seismic paper published just last year. And, and all of the records are actually freely available on Zenodo. So I've made them in SAC format for the seismologists, um, or you could just reprocess them with the same software. Um, a lot of these observations are from the NODA network. So that, that would be all of these ones from Central and um, Central America, the Caribbean, Mexico, Western US, and then into Alaska. Um, but there's a big set of events in New Zealand. These are all recorded at 10 hertz. The NOTA ones are all 5 hertz here. Uh, four events from the Nepal sequence, which those are all at 5 hertz. Um, two different sequences in Italy here. These are anywhere from 20 to 5 hertz observations. Just depends on the station. And then um, I included two 100 hertz observations or two, two events that are 100 hertz. Um, but these are due to calm and filtering, um, as I showed at the beginning. So they're a little bit of a different uh, breed of GNSS velocities, but they're still GNSS velocities here. Um, this is what they look like in, in distance space. Um, PGV, I, I did a number of histograms here to show, you know, sort of where we're sampling on the, the rupture distance front. So a lot of our observations are, um, you know, 100 kilometers or greater. Um, we have 671 total, um, anywhere from 4.9 to 9.1, but not many in that you know sub six range. Um, and the PGVs go anywhere from a half centimeter per second to over a meter per second. Um, we don't we don't have many of the super close observations that are you know less than 50 kilometers, but um, we do have a lot that are in that 50 to 200 range. All right, so. The way we're going to validate these observations is by comparing them against NGA West ground motion models. Um, and just a brief overview of ground motion models. These are, these are equations that relate the source, so the magnitude or the style of faulting, um, if there's slip on the fault, if you have a, a finite fault, relate those parameters um, and the distance to your fault, um, the different site terms. 
um, to your predicted ground motion at a station. So you take a source, you have some site terms uh, for, you know, underneath your station, and you want to predict what that ground motion is. Um, the NGA West um, project, um, so the NGA West 2 in this case, um, used all the same data sets. And so they're a suite of models with that same data set, but they're deriving coefficients slightly differently. Um, and you know exactly how they choose those coefficients is totally up to those authors. Um, for this study, we're gonna look at three different ones. Um, you know, the main reason is these three all have PGV observations uh, included. Not everyone has PGV uh, incorporated into their, their ground motion model. So this just made it much easier. Um, Bohr et al., this is more for like Southern California sort of earthquakes, strike slip events. Chu and Young's uh, is, is a little more general, although it's often used a lot for subduction zone events. And uh, Campbell and Bohr Zigna, Zignia, um, they are, you know, also a more general sort of ground motion model. They they do incorporate a lot of the, the subduction zone style stuff. Um, and really our driving question here is, are these GNSS velocities equivalent to the seismic velocities within these ground motion models? Uh, just to jump to it here, um, these are all of the observations in our data set against the mean rupture distance here. And I color coded them by magnitude. So you can kind of spot some events, um, you know, this light blue blob of event, blob of stations. These are mostly Kayakura. Um, these really deep blue, these are um, Takachi and Tohoku. Um, and then, you know, just a smattering of other events. Um, the two histogram differences, the red is all stations and the gray here that's on top of it, that's just Kayakura. Since Kayakura is, it's it's a strange earthquake that ruptures so many different faults. It, you know, it I don't think it fits really well into any ground motion model, but we just wanted to sort of test to see how that works. So for Bohr et al, this is, um, it ha does have some difficulty um, uh, modeling stuff like Kayakura. Um, actually does, you know, produce a result that's pretty close to, uh, you know, median of zero here, but um, but in this ground motion model, they rely heavily on the joiner bore distance, which is if you take a a slip model and then you just propagate it up to the surface and draw um, a, a circle around it, uh, and you're taking the closest distance to that that surface. That's what the joiner bore distance is. So it's often not a very good distance metric for subduction zone events. Uh, Chu, Chu and Young's actually performs the best. Uh, no surprise because it does, you know, it, it's a little more tuned for subduction events. Um, it, it's, you know, the distribution is fairly good and it passes a, a normality test here. So, um, you know, that was one thing we were looking for, you know, even though it's not necessary to pass the normality test, you know, it, it's always a good sign if it does. Um, CB14 kind of performs in the middle. Um, a little bit of uh, underperformance on Kayakura. This one doesn't pass the normality test either. And then um, then we derived our own ground motion model. So this should perform the best because it's based on our own data. Um, you know, it does a little better on Kayakura. It's a much tighter distribution. It obviously passes the Lily Forest test. Um, if we jump into what the statistics are, um, so this is the median residuals from the previous, uh, you know, previous plots there, and then the standard deviation of those residuals. Um, so remember, these are log unit um, total residuals here. Um, and then these are the, the self-reported uncertainties within the NGA West 2 database. So most of them are, you know, it, anywhere between 0.54 and 0.65 for those three um, ground motion models. And, you know, for CY14, CB14, we're a little higher than that. BSSA is definitely higher than that. But the one we we derive is actually, you know, it would basically be right in the middle of these sorts of um, uh, ground motion models. So it, it's, you know, it's it seems like it is, you know, a good assumption that our observations could be used within these 
these uh, ground motion models. Now, you know, there's there's some things to take note of, like um, the data set applicability of those ground motion models is very different. So we don't include anything under 4.9 because we can't really record it that well. And we have most of our observations at the high end, um, 6.5 or greater. We also don't have many, op or we have many of our observations between 300 and 800 kilometers. Whereas the model applicability range for, for most of these is less than 400 kilometers. Um, so they're really for near source type of events and their magnitude range also goes down to 3.0 plus their top end magnitude range is about eight. So, you know, there are some huge differences and if they were to incorporate in say NGA West three, um, some of these larger events that have been recorded, you know, maybe the statistics would look a little better. Um, one of the more interesting results I, I found uh, is kind of this throwaway figure from the paper. Um, but I was trying to look at, you know, what is the effective sample rate on the noise? And um, and so since in the Italian sequences, they were recording up to 20 hertz, I just downloaded one of the stations when there was nothing happening, processed 30 minutes of data, but I resampled the Rhinex files. So I you know, I, I basically ran TQC, sampled it from 20 to 10 hertz, 10 to 5 hertz, 5 to 1 hertz, and reran it through my code and then took the power spectrum of these. So, um, you know, just taking the, the standard deviation of those time series, you get these sorts of statistics. However, if you really look at these, these power spectrum for the higher sample rate, you're spending much more time in the higher noise range. Uh, of the time series. So, you know, 20 hertz is spending a lot of time up here, 10 hertz up here, five is definitely less. Um, but the interesting result is that if you're looking between, say, 0.5 and two seconds periods, that there's, you know, this systematic reduction in the noise um, from five, 10 to 20 hertz. And so if you take it, if you process it at 20 hertz and then resample, it after the fact to five hertz, you actually get noises that are are less than the original five hertz observations. Um, you know, somewhere between one and five hertz here. Um, this this would mean that the you know the initial assumption of stationarity in say the atmospheric delays or some of the other delays is is actually a little bit wrong. Um, you know, things are changing on these these fractions and hundredths of a second range and so you know if, if you were to design something where it's your on-site processing this you might want to sample this at 100 or 200 hertz and then just down sample it to something that's more manageable um looking at the shake maps we we took one of those earthquakes uh the the 6.6 .6 norcha event and um and played around with the shake map software so we downloaded all the the metadata from this event, um, the source information, the did you feel it from the USGS. Um, we added our GNSS observations. Um, we, we added their seismic observations. So this is the, the one that's on the website currently, the USGS website. So this is the published shake map. Um, you know, if we take out the seismic and only use the GNSS, we get something that looks like this. So larger ground motions, but we don't actually know if that's truly correct. Um, if you incorporate though the GNSS with this, so when you're running the shake map software, you get a model that looks like this. And just differencing these two from each other, you, you can see in the near field that there are some pretty large differences up to one MMI unit here. Um, and it's really just due to the data density. You know, we, ha we have so many more stations that are kind of right on the line of the fault um, you know, there it's good density in the um, the seismic, but there just happens to be more in this case in the in the GNSS. So, you know, this is a case where the GNSS would contribute to um, to a larger predicted ground motion. Um, you know, we can make the claim. All right, who cares? Like it's you know, it's one MMI unit in an area where it's already pretty strong. Um, but I, you know, I'm reminded of a story that my colleague Bill Fry told, where you know, in the initial phases of the Kayakura event, they didn't know, you know, what the ground motions were, and if 
you know, the area would have been passable on, on land or if they needed to send a ship around to the, the towns along the coast. And, you know, in that example, um, you know, after quickly computing their, their best guess of the shake map, they determined that, you know, there probably were going to be a lot of landslides in that area. So even the, these little changes in the shake maps um, could actually have pretty big downstream effects. All right, so I'm gonna just go go over some work of my um, my graduate student Jensen DeGrandi, who's been working on incorporating PGV into scaling laws for earthquake early warning. Um, and so right now um, in the GFAST software, which I wrote, um, we use the PGD scaling law, which you know this is base. It basically says that at a given distance, as you go up in magnitude, you should have more displacement. That that's really all that PGD says. It's just we've regressed it against different data sets over time. Um, and but that you know that only includes the displacement observation. Um, and so, you know, there's obviously some issues with the noise and those real time displacements. Um, there could be some site specific corrections. There's a lot of uh, logic filters that are required within GFAST to issue an alert within Shake Alert. So you know there there are some issues here, um, and we really want to you know tackle the case of will adding these PGV observations directly improve um, the magnitude estimate, um, and you know why would we even want to do this? I mean, besides the the points of the noise, you know if you really look at um, at what PGV is um, in an earthquake, it is very diagnostic of the distance to the source. So this is the Tohoku earthquake and with the slip model from the USGS here. And you see that the, the PGV contours, and you could probably plot up the, um, the actual recordings here and, and show the exact same thing. You know, when you when you start to really crank up the slip, it's you're you're gonna effectively get almost the same ground motion. You're not gonna like keep going up linearly over time it'll it'll reach a point and it'll it'll kind of level off you're going to get a very large ground motion and then it'll be more or less along a contour of the slip so you can effectively view pgv as distance in this case it, that's what it's going to be giving you for the most part i mean it's going to be scaled by magnitude as well um so we've been playing around with a few different scaling laws. So we have the original one. We've been developing, you know, a joint data set of PGV and PGD all the way for. I'm just trying to look at timing and all that, but I'm only going to show a few parts of this. Um, so you know, she's been playing around with, you know, at, if you were to just add in a PGV term to sort of uh, regulate this. This is the hypocentral distance. So can you can you regulate that distance um, based on the PGV observations? So there's two different forms of that. But then there's also one where you can just get rid of the distance term altogether. So you don't even have to think about the location of an earthquake. Um, and you know, th there's actually an analog to this um, in the literature. Um, so back in sort of 2005, earlier days of, of earthquake early warning as it's getting developed in Japan and elsewhere, um, this methodology called the Tau C method was proposed. And, and what Tau C says is that at a, basically for a given earthquake, um, it does not matter how far you are from the earthquake, you will have the same predominant period. So you could be a hundred kilometers or a thousand kilometers. You're gonna have the same value of Tau C. So Tau C in this case is just an integration of the acceler or the velocity over integration of the displacement, which effectively gives you a period term or a frequency. You can look at it either way. Um, but in rearranging our form of that previous equation where we remove distance, you effectively get the exact same thing. You know, this P, you basically have displacement over velocity here, which is going to give you a, you know, a time only. So it'll either be a period or a frequency. Um, and that's the sort of thing that we're trying to emulate here. Um, and, you know, this is still very preliminary, the work that she's been doing. She's expanding this data set out. This is not the full data set. But, um, you know, really, like, 
the, the cool thing here is that on these bottom plots, and, and this side is only for the bigger earthquakes, so greater than magnitude seven, it's actually getting a really good distribution um, without even including distance here. So, you know, this might be the, you know, might be a way that we can sort of look at the, the topic of determinism. Um, you know, this is obviously a very controversial topic in earthquake early warning, but if we look at the evolution of how this, this term is going uh, in an earthquake, you know, maybe it, it manifests much earlier than we think it does. That's obviously needs a lot more testing um, and more, more events that we need to add in. Um, something else she's been playing around with is, is machine learning directly, these GNSS velocities to displacement. Um, so, you know, take a velocity, a chunk of velocity time series and predict actually a displacement state after going through a recurrent neural network. Um, this is sort of what that kind of looks like in, in matrix form where you have, say, 60 seconds of a velocity corresponds to some sort of displacement at you know, so zero to 59 corresponds to displacement at second 60. Um, and in this, we're training it against the Gypsy X solutions. So these are post-process solutions compared, you know, being trained against velocities that are using broadband or broadcast orbits. Um, so the, the, you know, really the goal here is, can we actually generate the equivalent of post-process process displacements from something that could be produced on a receiver. Um, and this initial work is also looking quite promising. So these are just three examples. Um, you know, th these are, this is data that never saw, it was never used in the training. So these are, you know, waveforms that that are just, um, you know, they were just tested against. And, you know, while they're not um, perfectly aligned here, I mean, a lot of this is noise, um, you know, sort of, um, long period noise, but when you really look at where the, the wiggles are, where the, where the seismic waves are, you, you see this change in frequency content, but you also see a lot of these peaks get aligned and they really start to match up. Um, but, you know, really the, the interesting thing there is you notice that a lot of, in the previous slide, a lot of the, a lot of the pre-event noise and post-event noise was really high. In the in the Gypsy X solutions, whereas that was kind of diminished. Now this could be an overfitting problem. There's all sorts of things with machine learning that could be an issue. But you, you know, if you look at those um, power spectrum, the Gypsy X versus our our LSTM solution, our recurrent neural network here, we're getting actually a, a sort of lower noise than the Gypsy X solution. So you know, this take this with a grain of salt right now. This is something that we're we really want to you know keep keep pushing and, and revise the different uh, topologies of the machine learning model. But, um, you know, we're, we we think this is kind of the direction to go. Um, I'm going to make a plug for um, one of my colleagues' papers, Tim Dittman's, where he's actually been taking these GNSS velocities and looking at whether or not there is a seismic signal or is it noise. So by using a random forest classifier, can you actually pick out the sections of a waveform that would correspond to an earthquake? Um, and really where this would be valuable in, in earthquake early warning is with dynamic blacklisting and gray listing of stations. So you can, you have a thousand stations in the Western US, but like most of them aren't gonna be really recording what you want. So you, you wanna just be able to pick out quickly the five stations that are going to have a seismic wiggle on them, and you know this this sort of approach is actually you know there's there's a, a couple of papers that he's written that are related to this, and so he's sort of refining this methodology, and it's very promising. I think this might be the actually easiest way for GNSS velocities sort of get incorporated into the Shake Alert system. All right, so I'm going to finish up with just a couple slides on on our vision for a GNSS Velocity data center. And this is the NASA project that was funded last year. And really, you know, the, the whole goal of this is to generate high rate, real time GNSS velocities and, and TEC for the entire NOTA network. So any station that's real time telemetered, 
we would want to be able to to create these streams for so really in the same vein as a seismometer out in the field we it's just returning a northeast and up um velocity stream um you know we're going to end up building a number of data access options um you know you know api calls or you know a pub subscribe mode um batch processing of events um maybe even just a, a standard archive of past events also run training courses at future sage gauge meetings or any other meeting that that might happen um and and our project here is is pretty split between the data center development and developing these different applications that I kind of showed in the past uh 10 or so slides there uh but um so recently so we're only in like maybe month six of this project. Um, Henry Berglund has been writing a Go application. So the original code was, code was in Python, but he he wrote a Go application to do this exact same thing within the, the EarthScope um, cloud environment. And this, this application actually is able to run all 1,200 streams on two CPUs and four gigabytes of RAM. Um, you know, it, it's just pumping out these streams, we still need to do something with them and we need to write some codes to, to deal with the data and, and sort of visualize and, and make sure that the public can get this. But you know, in contrast, the, uh, the pivot displacement solutions right now are running on 40 different Windows EC2 instances. So the, the computational burden is massively reduced by doing this. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're pretty confident that within the next uh, year or so, we should be able to provide this to seismic networks uh, around the globe. Um, just, you know, some shameful plugs for our different, um, so I didn't actually define this term, time difference carrier phase is TDCP um, developments from our team. Um, the Snivel paper is this one in SRL in 2021, I think. Um, and then a couple of papers in Seismica, these are all open access. Um, the validation, which was a lot of the slides I showed, um, some of the ionospheric work we've been doing in, in GRL, um, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, the random forest um, machine learning stuff from Tim and others in JGR, um, you know, our funding sources for this project. And then, you know, I'm just going to finish with our take home messages that there's been many demonstrations and this was not a comprehensive overview of GNSS velocities for seismic monitoring. There are other groups, um, you know, I've talked with many of them and I, you know, I don't even feel like we're in competition. I, I think that the seismic community needs to get this from many different angles and many different people. Um, there's a ton of remaining opportunities. You can apply any seismic algorithm, you know, W phase or whatever, it, anything to these streams. Like there's such low hanging fruit here. Um, if you're just like a budding seismologist or geodesist, it's just, this is, you know, ripe territory here. Um, you know, in the short term, we kind of expect that these observations will be used in the sorts of rapid assessments like shake maps. And for early warning, um, there's there's certainly a lot of avenues we can take with this. Um, as we expand these data sets, record more earthquakes, um, have combined data sets. You, we haven't even really played around with combining like seismic events on the low end and, and GNSS velocities on the high end. We could be doing more AI ML demonstrations and then our end goal here is to allow monitoring agencies to just easily use and understand this data. We want to put it in their formats and have them plug it into whatever software they have for locating earthquakes or whatever. Um, and you know, our NASA project, um, it's a three-year project, and it really should be providing these 1,200 streams or more. You know, if other countries say they want in and they can provide us with you know, their streams, their RTN, RTCM streams, you know, we could be pumping out theirs as well. Um, and we expect this within the next few years. So thank you.
Thank you, Brendan. Um, cool talk. Um, I'm going to uh, turn off the recording um, of the Zoom. Uh,